most Republicans rally around President Trump, a new book explains how he has remade the GOP in his own image. American Carnage. This is the Washington Week Extra. Good evening. I'm Robert Costa. So far, President Trump has maintained consistent support from his base and Republicans in Congress. But now, facing an impeachment inquiry, he will need them more than ever, especially in the Senate, where he could face a trial should the House impeach him. But can he count on their support? In this special edition of the Washington Week Extra, we turned our attention to how we got here and how the Republican Party was overhauled by President Trump and eventually controlled by him. Joining me tonight is Tim Alberta, chief political correspondent for Politico magazine and author of the terrific bestseller American Carnage on the front lines of the Republican Civil War and the rise of President Trump. Tim, when you look at the impeachment inquiry and what it tells us about the Republican Party, we were talking about this on the program, Republicans still haven't found the line or the issue that's going to really make them break. Is that because they just know he has more political capital? Is it all politics? What is it? You know, I think it's a combination of things, Bob. I think you start with a baseline recognition among most of these congressional Republicans that at the end of the day, if their voters are forced to choose between them and the president, those voters are going to choose the president. The president is more popular in their district. He enjoys a rapport and a connection with most of these voters that they themselves have never enjoyed. And they recognize, they look around, they see what happened to Mark Sanford. They see what happened to Jeff Flake, Bob Corker, Justin Amash, the list goes on. They understand that the quickest way to lose their job is to cross this president. Now, you add to that the fact that they believe this president, many of them really truly do believe that this president is fighting for conservative values and a conservative agenda in a way that no other Republican has since Ronald Reagan. And people may sneer at that, but they will say to you, look, is he a choir boy? No. Is he one of us ideologically? Not really. But was he willing to go to bat for Brett Kavanaugh when all of this happened? I was down in Texas with the campaign managers for the Ted Cruz presidential campaign, the Marco Rubio presidential campaign, and the Jeb Bush presidential campaign just last weekend. And they all said something fascinating to me, Bob. They all said, our bosses, if they were the president and if they had nominated Brett Kavanaugh, they would have pulled his name from consideration. They would not have been willing to go through a fight like that. And I think it's a fascinating window into why some people, despite their discomfort with this president, still find themselves loyal to him because they believe that at the end of the day that this is sort of a zero-sum clash between Democrats and Republicans and that he's willing to fight for Republicans in a way that nobody else has. But why do Republican voters have that bond with President Trump, is it his nationalism, his grievances against the global economy? What is it? That, what's that bonding all about? You know, I think at the end of the day, it's actually got a lot more to do with culture than it does with policy. And, and, and there are certain issues, obviously, like immigration, like guns, that straddle those two universes. But at the end of the day, this president was willing to sort of take off the gloves and, and strip off the varnish and speak to voters in a way that no politician had before. And a lot of that got to a sense of cultural dislocation, you know, socioeconomic anxiety, a, a feeling of displacement that many voters had felt. And that's where, obviously, you get into, you know, a, a, a really fragile place in American politics with race, with nativism, certainly on policy with protectionism and isolationism. But at the end of the day, when you look at an economic populist platform offered by a Bernie Sanders or an Elizabeth Warren, it's not altogether different than some of the economic populism offered by a President Trump. What is the clear distinction between them? Obviously, it gets to those cultural issues, and the president has wielded those cultural issues time and again, whether it's football players kneeling, whether it's immigrants coming across the border, it doesn't matter. He has been masterful at manipulating those cultural issues. So if he's that kind of not only a political figure, but a cultural figure, inside the Republican Party. Is there anyone out there who has similar cultural cachet with Republican voters who turning on President Trump would actually change the dynamic inside the GOP? Is there anyone? Maybe there's no one. I've talked to the president's team about this, and they 
they say, it's interesting, they say that the only person who would have maybe been able to do that was Ted Cruz. That if Ted Cruz had held out, we all remember the famous convention speech in Cleveland where he refused to endorse Donald Trump, was subsequently booed off the stage, and then, of course, a couple of months later, with his tail between his legs, came back and issued sort of a half-hearted endorsement of Donald Trump. Ted Cruz was the one person in the Republican Party who was very uniquely positioned. He had made lots of enemies, of course, but there was a belief that he was so principled and he was so truly concerned about Donald Trump and his effect not only on the Republican Party but on the country that if he had held out all along that he could have been a singularly effective voice coming from the president's right flank but because he like so many other Republicans eventually acquiesced and you know submit submitted themselves to the president politically they have lost the ability to go toe to toe with him we have governor former governor of Massachusetts Bill Weld uh, Joe Walsh, the former Illinois congressman, Mark Sanford, the former South Carolina governor and House member, they're all mounting primary bids against President Trump. Could you see any of them getting traction or anyone else getting in of significance? Or at this point, is President Trump almost undoubtedly the Republican nominee? Oh, I think barring something absolutely biblical and catastrophic, uh, there's no way that someone else is going to be on the ticket for Republicans in 2020. Uh, not only because those aforementioned candidates don't have the juice to challenge him, which they really don't if we're being honest. We know how popular the president is with self-identified Republicans, but also the Republican Party is rigging the game in favor of of Donald Trump. You've seen dozens of states effectively move to squash any potential challenge to President Trump uh, in, a, in a mechanical sense by shutting down the primary or shutting down the caucus, effectively eliminating the nominating contest in their state and just renominating the president by default. That's something that is in many ways unprecedented. And of course, we remember that there have been real challenges in the past. Pat Buchanan against George H.W. Bush in 92. He didn't defeat him, but he really hurt him in that nominating process. We're not going to see anything like that. Well, that comes to your point. If there would be someone from the right, like a Buchanan type, it would be Cruz, but he doesn't seem to be moving in any way toward a primary bid. Not at all. Tim, when you read your book, it's, it's really interesting how Republicans are making a bargain with President Trump. Evangelical voters, they want to make sure conservatives are elevated onto the federal courts. Republicans want to have power. The Republicans you talked to for this book and your sources today, are any of them grappling with the bargain they have made as they faced an impeachment process on Capitol Hill? You know, it's a great question. I would say the one person uh, where I could really feel that tension uh, was with Paul Ryan, the former House Speaker, when we had a conversation, and not coincidentally, Bob, he had left office at that point. Um, I say not coincidentally because, you know, Paul Ryan and I talked a little bit about this, and he didn't exactly say this, but it was me reading between the lines. Look, I think there's probably going to be a reckoning for a lot of these Republicans who, at this moment in time, their head is down, they're trying to just put one foot in front of the other, hold on to their jobs, uh, keep the world from burning down, you know, get as much out of this Trump presidency as they possibly can while recognizing that this is a very unusual time in American politics, to put it mildly. But once they leave office and once they get questions from their grandchildren, once they start to look back on this period and try to make sense of it for themselves, I think that's when they will begin to fully grapple with it and maybe begin to express some remorse over exactly what they did or in many cases did not do. Final question for a little bit of fun. When you read this book, you think about the 2008 to 2016 period in the Republican Party from Bush to President Trump. When you look ahead to 2024, you think about Ambassador Nikki Haley, Vice President Pence, Senator Josh Hawley, Senator Rubio, Senator Cruz. How are you in that in, in, the, in this very early stage thinking through that 2024 Republican race, the post-Trump era? Yeah, I think the question in the post-Trump era is going to be who can do two very different things at once? Who can simultaneously marry some of Trump's populist appeal, channel some of that populist appeal. You mean on immigration and trade? On immigration, on trade. Look, I think what President Trump did so effectively, Bob, was he exposed a real complacency that had set into the post-Reagan Republican Party on those issues and others where Republicans in Washington just sort of took for granted that, yes, our voters support trade. Yes, our voters support liberalized immigration policies. Yes, our voters support entitlement reform, when really, at the end of the day, many of their voters did not anymore. So I think it's going to take a Republican 
important to recognize that some of what Donald Trump has done here is actually very constructive for the long-term health of the party. But at the same time, they're going to have to steer the party sharply away from some of the divisive, some of the nativist language he has used on the issues of immigration to really rile up that white working class base, because that ultimately is not going to be a viable long-term coalition if Republicans are going to hang on to the White House in 2024 and beyond. Who's best positioned to do that? And it I'll, could change, but who's best positioned right now? I'll give you a dark horse, a real dark horse, Will Hurd. Congressman from Texas' 23rd District, he's retiring from Congress. I would bet my bottom dollar that he runs in 2024. You heard it here first at the Washington Week Extra table. That's it for this Washington Week Extra. You can listen wherever you get your podcasts or watch on our Washington Week website. While you're there, check out our Washington Weekly News Quiz. I'm Robert Costa. Thanks for joining us and see you next time.